We have it in the base. Let's go ahead and you can show me what we got going on. Go ahead and hop in the driver's seat. When I turn it on, it starts popping a lot. I'll hear a lot of popping noises. Okay. Um, from time to time when I'm driving, um, the system will just completely cut out. Is that an RCA stuck behind your gas pedal? It is. I've been having to tuck this back behind the brakes when I'm driving. Wow. There's that. The no, other thing. Sorry. Before, okay. You paid someone to install this. I did. Unfortunately, I did. Now, how many times have you been back? <sighs> Four times. You've been back four times? Yeah. Okay, I can see why you didn't want to go back. Um, the other thing is there's a very obnoxious humming noise always coming from usually the front left speaker. Really? Mm-hmm. There's okay. always a humming noise going. But just the quality of the sound as well. I'm not yeah, as not thrilled with it as I could be. Yeah. Let's go ahead and turn it on and see what it sounds like. So, unfortunately, we won't be able to listen to it because it is not working right now. It died. Oh, so we can't even, we can't even listen to it. No. Oh, okay. All right, well, let's talk about what we plan on doing here. Are we going to keep this factory radio because it's integrated real sharp, or do we want to put in a new radio? I'd rather put in the new radio. Okay, because I know they do make a dash kit for this. That's cool. Now, I see you have Sirius XM. Do you want to retain Sirius XM? Uh, if possible, that would be great, but okay. if, it's, if it's not with that, I understand. So, what we need to do that is they do make a add-on tuner for that called the SVX300. Okay. And they make what's called a SAT1 antenna adapter, and that will allow us to keep Sirius XM. You will have to change your tuner. Now, the other option is, what kind of phone do you have? iPhone. You can do Sirius XM from CarPlay. That would be awesome. And so you won't actually have to pay for a subscription, the, the car subscription, you just use the web subscription. The okay. And it actually sounds better. I imagine. It's yeah. <laughs> so funny. Okay. All right. Do we have a factory USB? Yes. Okay. So we can retain that. Uh, you have steering wheel controls to so retain those. So they obviously put an amplifier in here. Where's that at? So the amplifier is going to be mounted on the back right seat. All right. Well, since we can't hear it, there's no point being here any longer. Let's hop into the back. All right, let's take a look. It's mounted to the back of the seat, I see. Right. We have three different RCAs and one just hanging out, and right. I see it in the seat there. Yeah. I'm guessing that appeared after you took it back for one of your four services. Exactly, yeah. Something cutting out, or did they just do that, hopefully, to fix your driver's door speaker? I, I truly don't know. It's, uh, I really don't know. Oh, wow. You can see the RCA yeah, right there. Oh, my gosh. They ran 18-gauge speaker wire for the subwoofer. Now, are we keeping this sub? We're not. We're not. What are we going to do for subs? We're going to put uh, two tens in there. Oh, wow. Okay, that'll be cool. So. All right, well, let's take a look underneath the hood to see what we have for a fuse holder. Okay. Oh, wow. We have some extra wire here. It's zip tied into place. Oh, no, the zip tie. Oh, there's one zip. Okay. So they just put a zip tie over the cover. Well, that's actually not a bad thing because these covers typically fall off. That's why we don't like to use these underneath the hood because they don't really clip into place. Oh, okay. I prefer the waterproof kind that twists together. And of course we'll make a mount that's actually gonna hold it in place. Okay, so nice. that, you know, if you go to a dealer or something like that, when you go to service the battery, it's not gonna just be like, hey, look at this. Right, right. The plan today is we're gonna do what we call 911 rescue. Okay. We're gonna pull out everything that they've done. Every single piece. We're gonna pull off the RCAs, the power wire, everything. We're gonna pull all your doors off because you had new speakers put in. Right. And we're gonna make sure that the speakers are mounted properly, they're connected properly. Try to figure out why that one's doing some funny stuff. Yeah. My guess is they cut the harness behind the radio to put in some form of a high level to low level adapter. So we'll go ahead and solder that all the back together, tape it up, make it look as factory as possible. And then we'll put in your new radio, get the amplifier all put back in. Now, as far as on the seat goes, we're not gonna do that. Okay. Amplifiers, yes, you can mount them to the back of the seats, but as you found, you've had problems there. Yeah, Wires absolutely. are getting pinched. Right. We don't like to mount amplifiers to the back of the seats because of that specific reason. I know you use your trunk to haul a lot of stuff. I do, I do. So we know we're gonna be putting two tens here in that box. It's gonna be all the way up against the back seat. Right. But what that's gonna leave us is plenty of room here. On the side. Or on the side. Perfect. So we're going to make an ABS panel. It's gonna allow us to mount the amplifier there. Okay. That way, you'll be able to still remove the box if you need to put in your 6,000 crates of right. windows my, and doors. All my stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah all, all the stuff. And you'll be able to fold your seats back down. If you need to slide something through, you won't have to worry about scraping the top of the amplifier. That would be awesome. So you yeah. get full functionality back. Okay. So how did you find us? Uh, I was actually just Googling down the street trying to find somewhere, and then I started looking at all the reviews. Right. Found some YouTube videos of you guys, and immediately was like, I got to get in there. This is probably the place to go to... Uh, 
get this all taken care of. Now, I before we get started on this, is there anything you want to ask us? I'm a firm believer and tell me or ask me anything now before we get started. Okay. You really can't do it once we're done. That humming noise. Yes. Is that going to be gone? Okay, that's definitely priority one is to make sure there's no humming noise when we're done. And I don't think we're going to have that problem. I okay. think I know what is causing that, which is the high level to low level behind the dash. Okay. More than likely is jammed into there and one of the RCAs is probably loose and touching metal and or the module itself is resting up against something it shouldn't be. Okay. We're going to be putting a new radio in, so that's to solve that problem, shy Sweet. of, of course, putting in a DSP or something like that. Awesome. awesome. All right, let me walk you back out and All we'll right. get started on your pride and joy. Appreciate it. No problem. So now that we've listened to the customer tell us all the problems he has with the car, it's time for us to come up with a game plan to move through this and get to the result that he wants in the end. Now, no matter what job it is, we always have a certain set of things, just like putting on seat covers, steering wheel covers. When it comes to audio, we also have a certain set of procedures that we have in place in order to get us to the end result we're looking for. And in this case, even though we're not doing a DSP, the radio that we're putting in has one built into it. It has time alignment, has EQs, crossovers, all those fun things. And we use them because why wouldn't we? It's going to give us a better sound in the end, which will give us a happier customer. What we want to do first, we measure the seat, meaning the location the seat was when it came in. When we pull the car in, we don't adjust the seat. So now what we're going to do is we're going to measure this. Now this is a procedure we just started doing oddly enough in like the last six or seven months. And up until this point, we just draw a diagram and we measure out what we need. We do this in any situation where we are gonna be using the DSP. One of the reasons why we're just using it on paper right now is because we're putting together an idea of how we want this to look, feel, and be. We figured we'd do a ton of these, try things differently, and then we'll go ahead and we'll have a sheet printed up similar to a check-in sheet that will allow us to easily put in just the numbers, come back in, and and adjust the seat so that's where it was when it came in and then we can take our measurements for the time alignment there's a couple positions that we found we like to take because we'll move the steering wheel as well as the back of the seat the bottom of the seat sometimes we have to lift it up and down so we take a measurement from here to here from here to the crack of the seat from the bottom of the steering wheel to the top of the seat then we go from the brake pedal to the front of the seat we go from the bottom of the seat to the floor and then we go from the butt of the seat here also up to the roof here. And all those measurements will allow us to get the seat back to where it was. Now that we have those, we'll go ahead and set this aside till the end of the install. We'll put the seat cover back in place. This particular car, he's already got aftermarket speakers, he's got an amplifier, he's got a high level to low level adapter. There is tons of places where the speakers could have gotten wired up wrong. And we know that somewhere there has to be because it's not even playing right now and we have a hum. But if this wasn't that situation, what we'd do is we'd grab our test CD and we would do a polarity test using our polarity tester so that we would know from the get-go if the factory has the speakers in polarity or out of polarity, if the factory mid-range and the factory tweeter are both in or out of polarity. That way when we're doing our system, we can figure out how we want to approach it. Do we want to leave it out of polarity? Do we want to put it back into polarity? Is the speaker we're putting in out of polarity? Is it the same way? Is it different? So there's a lot of considerations. And knowing that from the get-go speeds up the end results. You don't want to be at the very end and have to go, oh crap, the, the tweeters were wrong from what we wanted. Now that's not to prevent us from accidentally wiring something up backwards but that's why we check it in the end to make sure that we don't do that. Unfortunately, in this car, we can't even do that because it has no sound, nothing works, which means we're real limited as far as what we can do on a check-in. We're just gonna fast forward to the rescue that we're doing on that car. Now, anytime you start on a car that already has an existing amplifier on it and you're gonna be doing amplifier work, naturally you wanna disconnect the battery. We're gonna be pulling out all the wiring that's in this car, all of it. So the first place we wanna start is at the battery and just disconnect it and get it out of the way. I don't know why they couldn't cut it to length. We're gonna be pulling this wire out, so we'll just go ahead and remove this all together. When we're done, we'll be mounting our ring terminal in here as well, so we'll just leave it like that for right now and cover it back up. Another reason why we are pulling this wire out is that they ran CCA four gauge wire here. The reason why that's such a big deal is that if you're gonna be using CCA wire, you have to scale it up a size. What that means is that this amplifier would require a four gauge power wire. It has three 30 amp fuses, making it a 90 amp current draw. 
A four gauge CCA wire is not rated for that. A real four gauge wire is. So it would have needed a zero gauge CCA wire. What that means is that as time goes on, that wire underneath the hood is going to heat up. The shielding will eventually melt away and or the fuse holder itself that wasn't mounted properly is going to melt around the ends and could potentially melt into the top of the battery. It's actually a good thing that he's here because we could prevent his car from getting burned to the ground. Ooh, look at this. So we have three screws here holding this four gauge power wire in, which I understand it's a common practice. There's even a terminal called an Earl that is designed around that premise. But what I don't understand is over here, it looks like we have three more holes that at one point the amplifier might have been grounded there. And they're not filled in with any type of silicone or anything like that. Here in Florida where it rains a ton, water is definitely going to come up through these holes. We'll have to make sure we cover these back up because we're not going to be using these ground points. Oh, what the heck? What is this? So over here, we have a whole nother ground. I wonder if he had like a sub amp in here at one point and they just didn't bother to unscrew it. Now, one of the reasons I don't enjoy doing these 911s is not for what you're thinking. Not because it's work and we have to do extra work like check over somebody else's stuff. No, no, I don't mind doing that. I wanna make sure everyone has the best experience possible in the industry I've chosen to make as a profession. What aggravates me about these is that this guy spent his hard-earned money money that he could have done anything else with in his life but he decided that he wanted to upgrade his stereo because he's a traveling salesman he wants to make sure that when he's in his car he has the best experience possible he's in his car six eight hours a day he's been living with with this crappy sound this headache hating his car which in turn means he hates our industry because the people he picked first did such a crappy job when he buys his next car he might say you know what i want to make sure it has all the features in it from the factory because i don't want to deal with this he's been back to the other company four times and they have been able to fix his issues it can't be that hard we're not saving lives here oh we got a buck connector and a oh is that a live wire sticking out of there mm -hmm. awesome so that was just so that was just it. right here like that Oh, for gosh sakes. So one of the most popular videos we do on YouTube has by far been our 911 rescues. It's also poking fun at some of the practices that happen in our industry that are really depressing. Now, when he leaves here, that's not going to be the case. We're going to make sure of that as we do all our customers, regardless of what they're having done or installed. It doesn't matter to me. You spent your money. We're going to give you 110%, if not more, of what we can do. I'm going to stop talking because we are also on a deadline for this, and we need to start getting it apart. Now that we've gone ahead and disconnected the battery, what we want to do is get these door panels off, start getting these panels apart, get that radio out of the dash, find out what's going on behind there, what we have to fix, as well as, like I said, the door panels we need to find out how the speakers are mounted basically i can't wait to see what it is this is like archaeology just uncovering the the mysteries of what these other guys did to this poor guy's car now here at five star we have one install bay and we have two installers and we work as a team everything we do is as a team we divide the work according to how we want to get through this in doing so it takes a little bit of forethought because we don't want each other getting in each other's way what that means is that right now fernando is going to go ahead and start start getting the doors on the driver's side apart and I'm gonna come in through the passenger side and start getting the radio apart. I'll take the passenger four sills apart, get the back seat, get as much stuff on this side of the car as I can get done and then we'll switch sides and he can come over here and work on this side of the car and I'll work on that side of the car. It allows us to be more efficient and not be on top of each other, getting in each other's way and we can move through these cars at a faster pace. As an installer, one of the things you should put out of your mind right away is that you know everything. You don't, you can't possibly know everything. You can't possibly know how to take every car apart, how to integrate with every stereo. What you wanna concentrate on knowing is A, where to find the information, and B, how to use the tools to do the job properly. We have to pull this dash apart. The kit manufacturer does a great job of providing us with wonderful instructions on how to do that. Knowing that they do that is what you need to know. That way you can go before you start, grab the instructions, read them over, figure out how the radio comes out, and not scratch, break, twist, bend, improperly pull any parts of the dash. It has to go back the same way it came in. Another thing is use the right tool for the right job. If you're pulling a dash apart, plastic on plastic, you wanna use a nylon pry tool to do that. At this point, we're not really surprised we're gonna find 
shoddy craftsmanship. In this air vent here, the RC is actually caught up into the air vent. This is the new one they just ran. It's getting caught into the actual air vent when you put the dash can on. Dozen screws that hold this all in, and they're all wrong. They've lost some and tried to come up with things that don't match. Really? This sucks. Now they make T-harnesses for these cars that cost about 30 bucks. At some point, you gotta figure this guy's gonna be taking this equipment out and putting it back to factory, but somehow you decided that cutting it at a half inch away from the plug was your best course of action. Here's that RCA I was talking about that's stuck into the air vent. So we have this big ball of tape here. Brown wire in this, the shield ground, and they have it taped to these two wires here. And here was the ground. I guess that was in there somewhere too. It's just, just hanging out. Wow, what is all, oh, oh, we got tape. We got a lot of tape. Oh. Oh, we have some, what are these? Were, those don't even, oh, that's that. What do these go to? I don't even know what these go to. Oh, okay. So we have an LP74 and LP72. They just cut the speaker, wide them together here. Woo! Looks like they almost pulled the wire out of this harness here. Oh my gosh. Oh, they broke the air conditioner mount right here and it wasn't screwed in. That's why it popped off when we were taking the dash off. So behind the radio, it's pretty much worst case scenario as far as what these goofballs did. We we're gonna have a lot of fun soldering that harness back together with how close they cut those wires. Let's take a look at the doors. Fernando's got those off. It looks like they used some kind of adapter. I don't know why they didn't use the factory holes. And then they just have this screwed in. They've crimp capped it on there. That's, there again, that's not the end of the world there. They used some kind of a beaver to drill a hole through here. Let's go ahead and unscrew that off. And then in the back door, this must be the factory mount. Oh, I know what they did. Apparently they didn't give this guy back his factory speakers. My guess is that those are the factory speakers. Yeah, tell him to check it out. Still so on over here. This was the hole for the plug and they just cut it off. Oh yeah, cause there's the wire right there. That's the pin. They pulled it off the door. Yes. And then they didn't put the, either riveted or screws. Here's the bio rubber from the surround. So those are the factory speakers. They make adapters for this that cost about 15 bucks. Way cheaper than what a new set of speakers to put back in if he ever decides to trade his car in and keep his nice speakers. Now I don't even know if he's aware of this. The front speakers and the rear speakers don't even match. These are Pioneer four ways and these are JL audio two ways and the front door is a component was the tweeter connected yeah oh wow oh my gosh wow so they soldered the tinsel leads on insulated right to you can't make this stuff up man you have got to be kidding me Hey, quick question. Sure. What, what speakers did you buy? So I got Alpines and, J and uh, Jails. You mean you got Pioneers and Jails? Pioneers and Jails, yes. Okay. And you bought coaxles up front? Yes. You want to see what they did? I would love to see what they did. No, you wouldn't. So this is the rear speaker. So they didn't give you back your factory speaker. No. Yeah, yeah. You know why? Because these are your factory speakers. They ripped your factory speakers apart to make the mounting for your new speakers. Right. These are the tinsel leads off of the old speakers. They okay. just soldered them uninsulated directly to the speaker and then plugged it in. They probably patted themselves on the back for that one thinking that was pretty cool. Right. But yeah, that's why you didn't get your factory speakers back. I should have gotten them back. You right? should have gotten them back. Now, right. another thing too, hop into the uh, driver's side here. Okay. So they used two high level to low level adapters. This one was for the highs, this one is for the sub. This is your harness. They cut it, that is going to be really fun for us to put back together, but we will be putting it back together. The new RCA that they ran, this one, if you notice how it has this kink in it right here, yep. it was stuck in this air vent like this. Even though they ran a new one, when they put it in, they, they still managed to screw it up. So All yeah, right. <laughs> we'll fix it. I just wanted you to see. No, for sure, yeah, I appreciate it. So fortunately, the customer is actually waiting for a ride, so it was still here by the time we got the car apart and we saw what was going on with the speakers and the radio. We still haven't got to the floor sills yet, but at this point, I really don't think anything is gonna surprise us that much more. What we need to do now is come up with a game plan for reattaching the speakers. We're obviously not gonna use the old speakers 
mirrors and, and remount them that way. Two choices in which we have for replicating this. We here manufacture any type of bracket that is required in order to put an aftermarket speaker back into the factory spot. We divide them into manufacturers like there's Nissan, there's Hyundai, European Oddballs, GM, Toyota. You get the idea. And we have all the tools in order to do that. And we make them all out of plastic. We have ABS and on the other side we have Centra of various shapes and sizes. We also stock, as you can see here, as many factory speaker bracket adapters from whoever, we don't care, to speed things up. And most of the time they do a really good job at these. The second option is to see if we actually have a bracket for that car. And we do. It's in that bag right there, which is this guy right here. That means we're going to drill out the holes here that were the factory mounts, and we're gonna install threaded rivets to screw the speaker back into place, just like if it was a factory speaker. Now this is a threaded rivet insert tool, and what it's designed to do is just like a normal rivet, you put it in, you pull these two handles, and then once it's set, you unscrew it, and that's the threaded rivet part. Now we can go in and add in a screw that will screw in nice and tight and hold our bracket in place. The other thing we're gonna do to this bracket is we order in 1 seconds of an inch foam. And what this foam is for is when you're mounting two pieces of material on top of one another, sometimes it vibrates. To prevent any vibration, we apply it to the back side of the speaker mount as well as the front side of the speaker mount if the speaker manufacturer doesn't already put foam on the back of their speakers, which some manufacturers do. Like all things here, there's a process and a reason why we do it a certain way. For example, I said we use 1 32nd of an inch foam and there was a very specific reason why I said that. When we started doing this, we were trying all the speakers we have in stock. Some manufacturers make their speaker brackets out of a composite material and it's flexes pretty easy. That 16th of an inch foam or an eighth of an inch foam behind that basket will actually cause bowing where the screw screws down. We got in several different thicknesses to figure out which one worked the best. Let me get this over to Fernando so that he can then get that screwed into place. We're just going to go ahead and screw the brackets on. We'll get the speaker mounted in a little bit later. The other thing about this particular installation, now that we've talked to the customer and showed him what's going on, he bought a set of coaxials for the front door instead of components. That's what they sold him. I don't know why. So in the future, he's actually going to upgrade that to a set of components, replacing the factory weak tweeter and make it sound a lot better. He was unaware that it was as affordable as it is. Now they also sold sold them on something that I'm not a big fan of, two different types of speakers. When you're selling something to sell something just to fill a hole, not educating the consumer on what you're doing and just trying to make a buck is very shady. Everything about this is shady. Here's the finished product. It's now screwed back into place, easily serviceable. We have our foam on both sides. Now we'll be able to get our speaker back in. We have a proper hole for the speaker wire to run through. One of the other things to consider when putting speakers in the doors like this is some form of a sound treatment. We like to always recommend adding some form of roadkill to the door. The problem we have in a situation like this is that he's already been fooled once. For him, I'm gonna save that conversation until we do the upgrade when we add in the higher end components up front. By then, we'll have built some trust into the relationship. One thing we are gonna add to this is some foam, such as a fast ring, to the front to help couple that speaker to the door to give it the best chance to get all that sound and all that energy into to the car and not just wasted to the left and right of the speaker. Now what I want to do is show you what it looks like underneath those floor sills. This is what's underneath the seat when it sits down. The bottom of the seat is going to crush into this and over time what's going to happen is that we can see here this hasn't even been installed that long. You can see where that RCA has already left the mark. This is all Here's the power wire. The power wire is already sunk into it. Here's the RCA. Oh, here's the remote turn on. Ah. It all needs to be routed in with the factory harness. Everything is down this side. There's nothing down the passenger side. Just it's all 
it's all right here. Just a few seconds ago in the video clip, I had mentioned that adding sound treatment and upgrading to some components, we we're gonna wait till the next time. Well, because we planted that seed in his head and he's super excited now about getting this thing done right, he changed his mind. It happens. That means we're gonna go ahead and upgrade the front speakers to some components. They're gonna be Pioneers, so they'll match the rears. We're also going to add in a little bit of sound treatment to the panel behind the speaker, as well as where the speaker mounts itself. Plan is to finish pulling out all the wire. Tested tape does not make you a good installer. Just makes the wires sticky. All the wires out of the car now, we have this side completely apart as well as the back completely apart. When installing in the back of the car, we find it's a little bit easier to just go ahead and remove the whole back seat. If we're gonna be doing any amount of time where we're gonna be sitting back here, I don't like to sit on the seat itself. You can bend it and affect the brackets and sometimes it doesn't close properly. Plus, we're gonna need to get into this area right here so we can run our wires. That also clears up that area there so we can run the signal down this side of the car. Adding the components to the installation, we've really kind of like almost uh, ourself because we're on a time clock here and that's definitely going to add some time to the installation and the reason why is, is because adding components isn't as simple as just screwing speakers in and calling it a day you have to find a place to mount the crossovers that's important these things need to be mounted firmly into the door they also need to be in a place that's going to be dry because they're not waterproof a place to where you pull the door panel off they're just not going to fall out it's serviceable they need to be part of the car there's a couple different places we mount these and in an installation like this there's two that we choose from First, we look at the door panel, and this is a perfect area for it. There's plenty of room for us to run our wires. Problem is, in order for it to go here, we order these plugs here, and if he ever needs to take his car in for service, you can just unplug these simply, take the door panel off. It's clean, it's simple. It's just like any other plug in the car. The other option we've come up with is finding a place to mount it with on the door itself. If we do that, then we don't have to add this stuff in. It's going to be physically part of the door and will not affect taking the door panel panel on and off. The place in the door panel that we were just looking at is this area right here. What we could also do is make a mount using those bolts that allows us to mount this right here. It's going to be screwed in place so it can easily come off if we need it to. We can use the factory wiring harness to integrate it into the car. Doing it that way, the tweeter is attached to the door panel. For that, we stock in these guys here, male and female, of this harness so that you can still unplug and plug back in the tweeter just like you can from the factory. Now when cutting apart a harness to reattach, like in this case, you kind of want to pay attention. You just don't want to go at it and cut it all to pieces. For this one, there's two orange wires, so I want to make sure that they stay together in their pairs. The other thing that I'm noticing here too is that somehow I've lost about three inches of wire between this and this. That means I'm gonna have to go ahead and lengthen these wires as well. I decided that the best course of action for us to do is just go ahead and cut this harness all the way out of the car there's only three wires that are left and take it over to the bench. That way I'll have a little bit more control instead of working in the car right here. And then we can just bring it back in and solder it into place. We've cut about six inches of all the matching wires on this harness. Very carefully remove these connectors and solder these extensions on. Inspect your joint and add some shrink wrap. And we'll repeat that procedure through all the harness. We've rebuilt the harness. We've lengthened all wires to the same length. Now we'll go ahead and strip these and get it into the car. This blue thing here is a solder mat. We have it clipped into place up on the dash to protect all of this. We have a portable soldering iron. We can come in here and solder these two wires together. When soldering back together a harness, you have speaker wire side and you have the power wire side. If you notice when I was cutting these, I was cutting these wires one at a time. One of these might be a power or ignition or accessory or a CAN bus or any other thing that doesn't need to be cut with another wire. When you're soldering them together, also solder them one wire at a time so that only one wire is exposed at one time and it doesn't accidentally touch something else. 
The factory harness is rebuilt and back to normal. We're gonna wait for this to cool down and then we'll tape it up using a factory style tape. Now that we have the factory harness all put together, it's time to do some testing on that harness. We have factory backup camera we have to integrate into, the USB we have to integrate back into, steering wheel controls we have to integrate back into. So we have a couple parts that we're gonna be using for that. So we wanna do some testing now to make sure that those are gonna work once we get to that final stage of assembly. This is the factory USB aux connector and pack does make a harness that will plug into this. But what we've found is that most of the time it does not function. So we wanna test that first. Then Access makes a backup camera retention cable that we wanna test to make sure it works also. For steering wheel controls, we're using the SWI CP2. And then of course we have the factory plug adapter. We're gonna power up the radio we're gonna put in. On our workbenches, we all have power supplies to test equipment. Plug in the USB. The radio has power. So we're getting a charge light indicator, which is good. However, the connectivity light here isn't showing up. Let's bypass the unit. And CarPlay launches. So that means that this cable isn't gonna function the way we were hoping to. Put this back in the bag until we're ready for it once we get to the kit assembly. We're not surprised that that happened. I'm pretty sure we've only had that cable work in maybe one or two cars that we've ever done. But we have a solution. Pop this apart and pull out the main circuit board. And then we're gonna tape this to the top of the factory radio because we're not gonna need it anymore. What we are going to do is need this mount. Now he has an iPhone, which means he's not gonna be using the aux jack. But if he was, we sell an aux jack that we can put into this hole. What we're gonna do is put a black piece of plastic in here just to cover the hole. Then we're gonna take a USB cable that we stock just for this particular purpose. We're gonna remove part of the shielding here. Once we get it all cut and shaped, it's actually gonna back mount into there. We plug the front piece of it just to make sure it's lined up and then add some glue into those pieces to hold them both in place. The glue that we use is called CA glue. It's a two part glue. It's a thicker version of it. I like the thickness. It gives us a little bit of building and we have time to move it around and get it to the places we want. You don't want any of this to leak up. So I always like to hold it like this while I'm using it. That way all that will run down. Hold it like this for a couple of minutes just to make sure that it's nice and dry. Inspect it to make sure everything is mounted very tight. The last step we do is put this flexible tubing over the wire so that while it runs through the dash, it has a protective layer over it. Thread it back through the mounting, clips together. The one other step I like to do is add a zip tie to this to hold it all in place. Now this is all set and ready to get into the car. Since we're headed back into the car, let's look at this backup camera retention cable. It's a in and out cable. And what that means is that you have the version that plugs into the factory side and the other side that plugs into your factory radio. You have a male and female RCA end here and a bunch of other wires. What we really wanna look at is this guy right here where it says camera power six volts. This isn't going to provide the six volts required in order to turn on our factory camera. If we hook it up to 12 volts, it'll just blow up the camera. Now to stop that from happening, we need a step down converter. We use the pack volt 39. This allows us to step down multiple voltages along with doing six volts. This will also do nine volts, five volts, and 3.3 volts. Because we're just gonna need to do some testing, we can quickly wire this up. It's a four wire hookup. The white red on here is going to be the output going to our camera. We have a red, which is going to be our main power, and then our trigger is blue. In this case, we're going to be using main power and trigger as the same thing. We're not turning on an amplifier or anything like that. The five volt output on this is great for when you're doing an older Ford where you have the amplifier you need to turn on. Those amplifiers need five volts. They'll take 12 volts, but then you get that huge pop. Using this, we'll eliminate that. Twist our grounds together. If we wanted, we could go ahead and use this to power it up, but we're not going to. We have this tool here, which is specifically designed to test cameras. It's a CCTV camera camera tester, but it also works really well in our industry. It comes with a 12 volt output that we can just attach onto our cable here and here. It has an input, turn it on. Now we can go ahead and take all this stuff into the car. 
simple enough run to put in the USB, get that back up. We'll just set it here for right now. Once we get the harness from here, move back over, we'll zip tie that all into place. This small 18 pin harness is right here. It's not in the main power plug harness. Plug in, grab our camera tester. We could see the camera is on. It's aimed at the ceiling right now because our trunk lid is open. It does have backup lines that are built into the camera. The other thing while looking at this harness is all these wires that this has. This is a ton of wiring. And really all we have on the harness are five wires. That's it. This plug just has five wires in it. We don't need any of these extra wires going here. I can remove all these, not have them in the dash, getting cluttered, giving an opportunity to get snagged on something. The other thing we want to check because we are putting in a backup camera is whether or not the reverse wire is analog or digital. If it's analog, we'll be able to find it in the harness with a digital multimeter. If it's digital, it won't be here in the harness because it's done over a bus system. There was no smart harness required for this car, so my guess is it is in here, but there's no point in guessing. We need to test. Grab our digital multimeter. We're going to set it to DC. That's the line with the dots below it. What I like to do is go to the main ground that's in the harness, which is this black wire here. I also like to take my meter and test it to make sure that it's functioning and that I have two good connections. So I'll go over to what I know is constant 12 volts and I get 12 volts. That means I have a good ground. Looking at these harnesses, there's a couple things to note. On the speaker harness, there is an extra gray wire that isn't in this harness. So that's something to think about. And on the main wiring harness, it has three extra wires here and a bunch of extra wires in the harness itself. Now I know these extra three wires here, two of them are for steering wheel controls. So I know it's not gonna be those. And then when we were looking at the camera connector, I had said there's five wires. Well, typically on a backup camera, you only need four wires, two for power and ground, two for signal and shield. I'm gonna start here, so I feel that it may be in this harness. I like to start with the car already in reverse. That gives me 12 volts. Let me go ahead and pull it out of reverse and it goes away. We found the reverse wire. To depin this harness, I like to use this Delphi depinner. In this case, it just pushes in, remove, and the wire comes out. You just need to repeat that through the rest of the harness. That leaves us with this much nicer, cleaner harness that we can attach the Volt 39 to. This harness is all set. What we've done is we've added in that Volt 39, made it part of the harness itself, and we've made these colors at the end what we're looking for, an accessory, red, solid, purple, white, which is your standard color for reverse, and of course, a ground. We can integrate those into our harness that we're gonna build here that's gonna attach to the radio. The CP2 is a programmable steering wheel control interface. It has these dip switches right here that allow you to tell it what car it's going in and what radio it's getting connected to. And that information is controlled by an app on your phone. Once you launch the app, it's gonna ask you, you're gonna be using a CP2 or a CP5. Then you type in the car's information. Now it'll give you the dip switch code. So this is telling it it's in a Hyundai, and this one is telling it's connected to an Alpine. And though I've been told I don't need to, I always like to tape up over the switches so that while it's in the dash, there's nothing that's gonna bump those. That it just looks better than having an open bank of dip switches. The next page is the most important one. This is the one that tells us where our wiring is for the steering wheel control. And it's all on this main wiring harness here. To get a good reference point, I always grab whatever is constant 12 volts, in this case yellow, and figure out where that's at. And that tells me that I'm looking at the harness the right way. In this case, 12 is constant 12 volts. That's this right here. Now I know if I come over from the top four, which is this green orange, and if I come over from the bottom five, that's going to be this black. Those are the two wires that I'm gonna use to connect my steering wheel control interfaces. Now this is a very unique harness in that it gives you these wires in the harness. It's the only one I've ever seen that does that. Most of the time what happens is that if there is wiring like the steering wheel control, what I like to do because I don't like cutting into the other side is I'll go grab a second one of these, pull the pins out that I need from that harness, put them into my harness, and then I have a box where I keep all my open harnesses that I just use to pull out pins so I can pin them into these so I don't have to cut any harnesses. This is telling us what we need from the CP2. Constant 12 volts yellow, our black ground, our secondary output ground, our red accessory, and the white 
red, and the rest of the wires will not be used. That means we should be able to hook these wires up to this harness and plug it in and it should work. So let's do that real quick. With the unit plugged in, we see a red light. What should happen is when we hit a button over here, it should switch to green. And we wanna test every button. Fly them up, line down, track up, track down, mode, mute, all the phone buttons, and we get green on all of them. And the reason why you wanna test every single one, some cars, there's actually two or three or four steering wheel control wires or it's a data bus and you have two data buses you have to attach to or there's a loop harness that needs to be installed to loop the foam buttons back through and that's really all the testing we have to do for this particular vehicle to see what works and doesn't work before we get the radio into the dash doing some pre-check work like this makes life a lot easier in the end once we're already almost done thinking we're yay rounding the corner and then find out no the usb doesn't work and no the backup camera doesn't work and why let's head back over to the bench get all these harnesses made up final assembly on the harness is complete we have a couple different things going on here we're gonna be using speed wire coming from the amplifier to in the dash to power up our speakers we've taken the factory speaker wires along with the remote turn on from the radio the remote turn on loops all the way through the harness and comes out here to the end speed wire is a nine conductor wire it basically has all eight speakers and the remote turn on built into it so they're all right here so we can easily attach that onto this backup camera as we've already talked about. Steering wheel controls are now integrated into the main harness. The radio we've used has a big external fuse holder, so we've taped that up and set that off to the side. Steering wheel control will plug into the radio along with our main harness. This guy is complete. So we've gone ahead and added our roadkill sound treatment to the front doors. Those are the doors we're concerned with. We did what we call our speaker special in that we concentrate on just doing the speakers. It's a smaller pack. We don't do what I call the full baked potato, which is every single thing you possibly see. We just really emphasize the location. And in this case, it's this side of the door. We're, we're worried about this making noise and rattling, so we put most of our effort into the panel on the back of the speaker, and then we add to the front here, also reinforce that. On the rear door panel, we're not doing any of the sound treatment, but we've riveted in the speaker bracket. We've used a speaker bracket. We've used the right screws to actually screw the speaker in. When they had put it in, they used big pan head screws, which were overlapping and not actually screwing the speaker flat into the door. We've taken taped up our wiring. We don't have the red tape like they have, but all their wiring is taped up, so ours is the same as well. This means we can go ahead and put our door panel back on. This guy is done. To hold the crossover, the mount we made, we said it mounts to these two bolts here. There was also a factory clip up here that allowed us to make a little tongue that would stick into it. Then we built in an L right here. That way we can put a screw here as well to hold this so that it's not vibrating. The crossover now we can line up with the door and it'll mount just like this this and that will allow us to bring all our speaker wires up and integrate like we talked about. This is the final look at how the crossover mounted. All our ends are color coded. We've insulated all our wiring. It is all zip tied in place. It goes into our hole. And then the last thing we have is the tweeter that we need to take a look at. Factory tweeter is mounted right here and it is a two screw mount. This guy right here. What we have to do is make this same shape that we can then attach our new tweeter to. Our tweeter is isn't much bigger than the factory, but we can't pull this tweeter out of its bracket. For that, we're gonna use some eighth inch plastic to fabricate that same shape and allow us to put our tweeter right back here where the factory one goes. The tweeter bracket was cut out, and then we went ahead and added foam to the side of it here so that just like a fast string, but for a tweeter, it pushes all that energy into the door panel. We retain the two factory screws. We have our clip right here to go into the car. So with the foam, the wiring, and the tweeter clip installed, Installed. That finishes the wiring on this side. We have this done. Let's marriage the two together. This was the area of concern right here. We had to make sure that that crossover fit perfectly into this gap. There's only about a half inch of play there for this to be mounted on. See, it clears the crossover. Next, what we want to do is mount the amplifier. To do that, we need to come out with a panel that it can attached into this side structure here. The other nice thing about mounting it here is that all our power wires, speaker wires are all going that direction so they can easily be terminated into the car. But the RCAs are gonna be sticking out this way. So we wanna make sure we get this as far forward as possible and that what we make sticks out far enough to protect the RCAs from getting bumped. Located behind this is 
really nothing. This is all open right here. Our wiring will be able to just come into here and then up into the side. So I'm thinking we're gonna do is what we like to call a sandwich mount. A sandwich mount is where we take two pieces of plastic, one on the outside that it's gonna attach to and one on the inside. And then we screw the two of them together because this panel isn't gonna go anywhere. I wanna make sure that the panel goes all the way to the floor, but it has this half inch piece of floor mat that's in the way. We'll have to route or groove into our panel so that it tucks in behind this. So I'm gonna go cut a piece of 10 by 16 half inch Sentra. We have our 10 by 16 panel here and we need to get it into the car so we can test fit it. However, I want to be able to carve an arc in here that matches the way the car is set up. The problem is we need to put a groove here in the bottom so that it'll slide into the carpet. It needs to be about three quarters to about an inch. I've gone ahead and put the rabbiting bit into the router and now we'll go ahead and make our adjustments. We wanna start out a little bit lower. We're gonna make two passes. take it over and test fit it into the car. Floor mat turns right here. This is sitting on, so I need to actually remove this whole portion of it right there. Trace the carpet. And then we'll just go over to our scroll saw, cut that out. And I also want to round these two corners here so it looks a little prettier. We have our completed panel. Let's go put it in the car and we'll make our back panel to mount it in place. On the back side for that back piece of plastic, we used quarter inch ABS. And it's in there really nice. Go ahead and take this back out, get the amplifier wired up onto it. When installing this amplifier, it has a unique feature on it that is not exactly installer friendly. The way the power wire comes out of the amplifier it comes out at an angle. Well, when you screw an amplifier down, the power wire needs to come out flat. That's a problem, because now we have to put this steep arc here in this, or we have to drill holes in here and have the wire immediately exit. What we do to combat that is we add risers to the amplifier to actually lift it up a little bit and get it off of the panel so that we add in that extra half inch for that wire to turn. Now the nice thing about that is that also gives it a little bit of extra air behind the amplifier, as well as in this case, the RCAs can be tunneled underneath the amplifier and out of the way around the top and side because we have very little room here and here. Before we screw the amplifier down, we're gonna take our RCA, in this case, it's a six channel RCA, and prep it for this installation. This particular RCA has a front rear sub indicator here, as well as connect to source unit tag and then the same on the other end other than the source unit tag. All of this is going to be mounted underneath here or in a sleeving so we're not going to be able to see that. What we do is we add in colored heat shrink to match the same color as the speaker wire. White is driver's front, gray is passenger front, green and purple. We add those onto our wire and now it's extremely obvious which RCA is which. So our RCA is prepped and ready to install onto our amplifier board. Now prepping an RCA for this type of installation involves shielding the ends as well as covering the whole length of the cable that's gonna pass through the car to protect it all the way up into the end that goes by the radio itself. The one thing I like about this particular RCA cable is that if you'll notice, it's flat. Very flat. So that's gonna make running it through the car super easy, as well as underneath this amplifier. This RCA is gonna run right down the center of the amplifier. What we wanna do is we want to drill holes here for us to attach zip ties to hold this all in place. Once we have the length determined, I'll pull the zip tie tight. The head of the zip tie, where it goes, depends on how the panel is going to mount down. In this particular case, it's gonna be mounting flat up against something. I don't want the head of the zip tie mounted to the back of this panel. It won't necessarily pull flush like we want it to into the carpet. Putting them so the heads are facing up will be fine. The other thing I wanna think about too is where this RCA needs to come out of this board. Do I need it to come out right here? 
power wire is going to be running this direction and I'm probably going to just drill a hole here for the power wire to go straight through. I might want it to snake and come out up here because I plan to run these up at an angle and into the car this way. If they come out towards here, that might be a better place for them as opposed to down here. It's one of those things you want to spend some time thinking about before you actually start drilling holes is how this is all going to sit in the car itself. So I needed to do this shape right here and come out here at this top. So this side of the amplifier is totally complete and ready to go. I don't know how they set this amplifier up, but we're just set it the way we would normally prep an amplifier if it was brand new out of the box. And that is turn the gains all the way down and set our crossovers at 80 hertz front and rear. Now that we have the signal done, we're gonna move on to the power side. And for that, we went ahead and drilled a hole here. We've insulated every inch of the wire with the flexible loom. It's all gonna pass through a hole here. Now once this gets into the car, we'll cut a hole in the same exact spot spot and that will allow the wire to S bend in. There won't be any tight spots or anything like that. The only thing we have left to do on the amplifier is get the subwoofer wire made up as well as tie in our remote turn on and our speaker wires. This amplifier has the screw down style terminals that bite into the wire. To protect our wire we're going to go ahead and use ferrules which is a sleeving for the wire. The other thing we want to do on this end the wire is going to come out and turn. We want to cut one wire shorter than the other. This tool is designed to compress the ferrule onto the wire so it gives it a nice tight crimp and that'll go in and it's going to come straight across underneath the power wire into the car but we're going to dress this wire up as well on the end that's going to be at the subwoofer we add a piece of custom heat shrink that has our logo on it and of course we make it obvious which one is positive and which one is negative our slight shorter l bend here is all set and ready to get screwed into the amplifier as well as i went ahead and drilled in the holes for the zip ties like we said earlier speed wire is a nine conductor wire. It has a solid and a stripe of each pair, gray, white, green, purple, as well as our remote turn on. When doing this, we need to make sure that our remote turn on is longer than the speaker wires because it has the farthest distance to travel over to the input on the amplifier here. So that looks about the right length for it. Now on the ends that are going to be exposed, we're going to twist them into place and we're also going to put some blue loom over the remote turn on. Because there's nine wires and they're all going spinning through here at the end here before you put your last piece of shrink wreck over it you want to make sure that they're all lined up the way they need to go into the amplifier so this amplifier goes left right left right so that's going to be gray white purple green The wire in the amplifier now is done. Let's take a closer look at it. The fast wire is mounted into place along with our RCAs and base knob controller. They go up in, left, right, left, right. Our sub wires are in. Now these are just pushed in the holes. They're not actually screwed in yet. We have to do our gain adjustment still. So we're gonna be pulling these out. And with these tiny screws, even though we have the ferrules on there, they dig in really hard. I wanna wait and make sure that the last thing we do is tighten up the screws on these. Power wire is all set and ready to go. Sub wire out. Out. The remote turn on is zip tied in. We need to get this into the car. Amplifiers mounted. One of the really nice things about taking the panels off of the car and having access to everything that's hidden behind them is this right here, factory ground point. We wouldn't have been able to see that with this panel attached as we can attest to them having all these grounds, which we did go ahead and cover up so they have to worry about them leaking into the car. That means we could shorten up our ground wire, attach it right here to the factory ground. We're also going to go ahead and get all our other wires running forward into the car. So as we said for the battery, we wanna make sure that it's mounted firmly in place. We don't want it to be 
falling around like it was previously. How we're gonna do that, down here is the bolt for the factory bracket. We remove that, which allows us to take a piece of quarter inch ABS, and we're gonna make an L bend in it down here at the bottom that's gonna rest into that, and then this piece will come up high enough to where we can mount our fuse holder right here. This is the panel that holds the battery in place. We wanna make sure we make our plastic that can sit on this and use that same screw. What we did is we thinned out the ABS here on the bottom. We took it down to an eighth inch, and then we've heated it up for us to mold this into it just like this. This is going to screw directly into the battery. Ground wires attached to the factory ground point. The wires are all zip tied into place, and then they split off here and go across the car there. And the power wire and the base knob are coming up here forward. We started to put the back of the car back together. Fernando's getting the power wire up through the firewall. We completed the fuse holder. The really cool thing about this particular fuse holder is that it comes off of the mount. That makes servicing it easy too. They need to remove this panel, take this off, they don't have to do anything to the fuse holder. We had to go to this bolt to attach it. If you recall, this was the bolt that they had used to attach their power wire. That is a V-shaped bolt, meaning the bottom of it is shaped like this. And how it works is as it tightens down into the mount, it pulls together the battery clamp and tightens itself onto the battery. When you put a ring terminal underneath that, it can't pull down as much as it needs to and you're going to have a loose battery connection. Now that we're nearing the end of the install, we taped up the part of the harness we had to fix so that it looks more factory. We have our RCAs in the dash, went ahead and connected our speed wire into the harness. Now it's just a matter of plugging everything in. Scan over your harness as well as into the dash just to make sure everything is connected and ready to go. Push on the eighth inch, make sure they're plugged in. And we've gone ahead and also moved the steering wheel control interface over here to the side so that we can put this back in. And once we get this screwed into place, we won't have to worry about pulling the radio in and out. There's a harness that attaches into the top of the radio here. We wanna make sure that we have access to that. Everything at this point should be plugged in and ready to play. We have a bunch of testing we need to do to verify everything that we've put in. The first of which is making sure all the functions on the radio do what they're supposed to do. Put it in reverse. We can see the ceiling, test our steering wheel features. Call Fernando. Calling Fernando Lopez. Now what we're gonna do is move into some of the audio tests we need to do. We need to do a polarity test to make sure that everything is functioning properly. This does not have a CD player, so we're gonna be using our phone to do that. We have a pop sound already recorded into it. What this is gonna do is it's going to flash green or red telling us how this is connected. So we have green, green, red. That's exactly what we're looking for. Green, green, red as well. Another nice thing about doing the polarity test is you physically have to go around and check every speaker to make sure there's sound coming out of it. At the beginning of your testing, you immediately know what's going on. So now that we know all the speakers are moving in the right direction, we can move on to gain setting the amplifier. There's a couple different ways to do that, and we have a tool to do it any way we need. We have a DD1, we have a DD1+. Plus. We have two different handheld oscilloscopes if needed. Then we also have a giant bench top seven inch screen oscilloscope. For this install though, the DD1 will be fine for what we're trying to do. When you're doing any form of single note playing, in this case we're gonna play a thousand hertz, zero dB. Make sure all your speakers are disconnected. Disconnect them here at the amplifier, not somewhere else down the line. It's a good way to burn stuff up. For this, we're gonna start out with a zero dB thousand hertz test track and we're going to turn it up and see where the radio is clipping at and that'll illuminate this little guy here and tell us turn it up and we have it highlighted here now we want to try to do is be able to turn the radio all the way up it's all the way up and it's all the way up bonus thank you now we'll play a zero db 40 hertz test track and see if we can achieve the same thing all right we have signal we have 40 hertz detected. This radio is not clipping at max volume. Play a negative 5 dB at 40 hertz, and we're gonna set the gain to that. What we're looking for is that red light right there at the top coming on. We don't want that to happen, so we're gonna set our, pull that just barely come, so it doesn't come on. We're gonna do the same for the 1000 hertz track on both front and rear. 
Our gains are set. While I'm screwing the speakers in, Fernando's gonna go ahead and grab that sheet of paper from the beginning of the video. Remember this guy right here? He's gonna get that seat put back in place. Now that we have all the measurements we need to put in the time delay adjustments on the radio, we're also going to want to tweak the EQ a little bit. Sure, we could just settle for powerful or super bass or something like that, but it's got adjustment, we should use them. To do adjustments on this, you're gonna need some form of an RTA. For this, we're just gonna use this guy right here. Audio controls, I test mic. It's a simple microphone-based RTA that plugs right into an iPad, such as this guy right here. It's not the only RTA we have, though. We have three handheld RTAs, as well as an audio Frog RTA that plugs into a laptop. We have the old school big guy audio control classic sitting in a box up there. And the reason why it's sitting in a box up there, we really don't need it anymore. We have this guy, the DMRTA. And this one isn't actually the functioning one. This is the beta. We were actually part of the beta test on it. The actual DMRTA is sitting right here charging its battery. Now, I, as you can tell, am not somebody that just wants to have one of something. We did run into a situation where we screwed up a software update on our DMRTA. And because it's become such an integral part of our tune, we have a second DMRTA on standby ready to go. It's what we do for a living, so we should have all the tools we need in order to do the job correctly. Let's hop into this car and get this thing tuned up. We need to go in and enter all those values first and while we're doing that, because it is a hot day, we will go ahead and run the air conditioner, but once we actually get to the tune part, we're gonna shut that off, as well as the engine. This one has a nine band parametric EQ. It's not as good as, let's say, a full DSP EQ, but it is pretty nice. come from a single point in the center of your sound stage. So those are the test tracks that we play anytime we get into a car, whether we're doing something as basic as a radio install, or we're doing something full complex DSP, crazy multi-channel system. We play the same song every time. It's annoying, we really don't like it much anymore, but we know exactly how it's supposed to sound. We know where the instruments come from, we can hear them, it sounds wonderful. Now normally what we do at this point is we've worked all day, we've had this wonderful time. We like to go ahead, start up the car, Forget about the mics, forget about everything, and just listen to the music. That's the best part of the day, isn't yes, it? Yes, definitely. It's kind of our little reward. Well, I can tell you right now, this guy is going to be freaking out once we get him in here and let him listen to this. Now, one other thing that we did, and I'm gonna go grab him here, but one other thing we did that I wanted to point out, we've gone ahead and located the Pioneer base knob right here into the factory panel, so it looks really nice. It's that fun moment. You ready? Right, yeah, yeah. Did you hear it? I did hear it. You excited? I'm very excited. Awesome. Yeah. All right, come on. Let's back. Let's take a look at the trunk first. All right. And we'll show you what we did there. So as we talked about, nice. we have the woofers with the grills. Yeah, that's nice. 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 Yeah, that's nice.